for being here today, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I also want to give a special thank you to Permanema uh, for opening up the session with uh, some of her great discussion and thoughts on beyond the new realities of entertainment. So I have a bit of a confession to make. When I heard about this topic, I tried really hard to get out of it. Uh, Ola probably figured it out that I was trying to get, hard, get out of it. Mainly because I'm like, I, I can't predict the future beyond the new realities of entertainment. Like, what does that look like? And then I started thinking about the phrase how history tends to repeat itself. And I thought, well, maybe we should look at what the last 10 years has taught us and how can that inform the next 10 years of entertainment? So that's what I wanted to share with all of you today. Uh, but just a deeper dive into our company, uh, just so we're all on the same page. We're a mobile gaming company. We started out in 2006 as a corporate social networking site, but we exited as a mobile gaming company. Uh, it's due to a little bit of startup magic called The Pivot and several more. At our height, we were six offices around the world. Um, with over 1,000 employees. Uh, we've had some really phenomenal partnerships, mainly in Hollywood. Our largest game is Marvel Contest of Champions. And then our investors have been quite diverse as well. We've had um, Silicon Valley with Google Ventures. Hollywood um, invested in us as well as some strategic company like Alibaba in China. And then, as you can see, this is uh, kind of what some of our games look today. We aim to be a triple-A console quality game right in your pocket where fans can access 24-7. And just this year, as mentioned in the intro, we exited to Netmarble and Fox Next. But we weren't always this way. In fact, this was what Kingdoms of Camelot first looked like. This was our first game, and it's quite big because it was on Facebook. And our job in 2011 was to take this big, fat game and fit it into this tiny little space called mobile. And from that, we learned a lot of things. Um, so as you can see, uh, mobile was around since 2007, but there's been a lot of iterations from there. And I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the lessons that we've learned in mobile. Now, some of these are actually very, very obvious. Uh, particularly today. And that's mainly because, you know, we've been living with mobile for so long now. Well, a couple years, but it feels like so long. And so, but for us, we didn't know any better. We were growing up in this world of like, how do we build this wonderful content on this new advice? How are people even using this? So I'll go quick through quickly about some of these lessons we learned, how did we learn them, as well as like, what is it that, how does these things inform um, kind of the next 10 years? So um, the first one, mobile-friendly content, content consumption, business model, compressed cycles, and consolidation. So I'll go through it quickly. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting about the mobile phone was ubiquity. As you can see here in 2005, if you're at a conf concert, you probably just would have saw a bunch of heads. In 2013, a bunch of devices above those heads. It was just everywhere. And people were on it all the time, in the subways, while they're walking, even in the loo. And so much so that in China, um, they created a specific lane for, for use, cell phone use so that more accidents don't happen. Um, so this, contextual, uh, this contextuality also being with you all the time also meant that you were accessible all the time. I remember in 2003 when the Nokia feature phones were still really big, my manager at a consulting firm refused to carry his phone. And I'm like, why? The clients need to get a hold of you. Your team needs to get a hold of you. And basically he said, you know what, Holly? I just don't like to be reached. I like the idea that the phone calls my desk and not me. But now this, this device was on you all the time. So that information is pushed to you constantly. And now we're su super intentional. We pull it out to get information pushed to us. But maybe one day, the information is going to be pushed to you like Minority Report. Um, so for us, what did that mean that it was mobile-friendly content? Well, first, it was quite contextual. And one of the things we realized early on, one of our tenants, was you've got to be able to play our game with one hand. The other thing we realized also was that the content got consumed really quickly and in bite-sized kind of uh, sessions. So that meant that we had to change our timers on our setup. 
we needed to be able to allow entertainment within that two minute interval of waiting in line, waiting for somebody, waiting for the cab. So basically waiting entertainment is what we needed to do. Also, in terms of content consumption, uh, this also changed a lot how we created content. So the traditional mobile experience has been, in the Western world has been through a console. Uh, one of my friends basically kind of said, hey, it's like a lean back experience where you're sitting in front and, and you're with your friends. And it's very cinematic. Then PC gaming is very much a lean in experience. And, and with a phone, you're like a lean over experience. And this has really changed a lot of how we created content. Because in the console world, in order to engage your fans, you really had to think about the sequels. That's how you do it. That's how Star Wars engages its fans, is it creates another movie. But now, through server-side technology, I can push updates to your phone automatically. And what this fundamentally changed was many things, not only culture, but really thinking and a mindset around games as a service. It wasn't uh, something I was designing and then pushing to you. It was really much games as a service. So pretty much uh, we started behaving less like the movies and more thinking about content like TV. Was it episodic? How do I keep it engaged? I cared a lot about the audience a lot more than a movie would because I wanted this long-term relationship. And finally, we saw that the business model really changed over time. So up until 2012, the top grossing apps were premium ads, or sorry, not premium ads, it was premium games. So basically, people would pay $2.99 to play a game. But in 2012, it was a very special year. It was the first time an in-app purchase game topped the top grossing iPhone apps, and it was a game. And since then, this is uh, from, I believe, 2015 or 16, it's always been an in-app purchase. I have never seen a premium paid app on here. Um, at the same time, what was happening is uh, we had compressed development cycles. So Facebook took three months to build a game, early mobile, nine to 12 months. And if you're super lucky, mo AAA mobile game, 18 to 24 months, if not even more. The marketplace was also moving. So I think this was a really telling side, slide for us. The number 100 game was making $300,000 a month in revenue. The number one game was making $4 million a month. That's only 2012. By the time it went to 2015, the number 100 game was making $1.2 million a month. And the number one game was making $80 million a month. And that's just in a span of three months. So you have these cycles that are compressing at all these different areas. And then you have consolidation. Uh, it's mature market. The top. The top 10 basically get the 25% of the market share. So it's really, really hard to crack into it. So those are just how we kind of learned some of these lessons. And I started thinking, well, how does this inform some of these new realities um, in terms of entertainment? What does this all look like? Well, the first thing is around uh, ubiquity, right? Uh, so with the mobile phone, uh, there's a lot of intention. Like, you pull it out to be able to input. But there could be, and there is, the Alexa's, Alexa is the fastest growing, I guess, platform out there. Every, phone's, every home is getting a speaker because voice is going to be so easy, right, to create these inputs. And once you're able to create these inputs, all this data, the outputs look very different. And then one day, I think, you know, the thought can just turn into action. And so the ability to input is going to get lower and lower. At some point, and some would argue that we already reached this, what we call a singularity. So I'm offloading all of my tasks. So if you think about before the dishwasher or before the car, the tasks that I needed to do take so much longer. But now I could offload all those tasks, right? Um, and now I can put input it. I say, Google, just tell me what is my day like, right? And it already knows that, and once I input already that I, I hook up my calendar, it knows everything, it does an input, and then that, that input informs the technology, and then it comes basically into what we'd like to call a self-sustaining and a constant change. That's the singularity. And at some point, some argue that this has already happened, that this will be not only self-sustaining, but very much become self-aware. And that's probably a plot for a movie called Terminator. But with this, uh, you pretty much can see that you've offloaded all this technology. So where does that leave us? That leaves us with a large, what we call, leisure economy. 
um, you now have a lot of time. Time to do what? Um, so as entertainers in this room are people who make entertainment, one of the things we're always fighting for and making sure we're really respectful of your time is your leisure time, making sure you're entertained, making sure that you are getting what you need, as well as helping to set good cultural standards. So they talk a lot about this leisure economy, and I believe those of you in this room who are doing gaming or any type of entertainment, this is where we can excel at and really think about how are we going to push people's time? What are the things we were, we're going to invest in? The second thing is I realize when people have more time, they start thinking about purpose. They start slowing down and reflecting. Uh, reflection is just the ability to connect the dots in your life to really find out what is the thing that you were meant to be here for. And it leads to so many things of creativity, of peacefulness, as well as mindfulness. So many breakthroughs in religion and um, in new franchises like Disney has come from finding this purpose. So what does the future hold for us? I totally believe that um, for any company or any organization or anything that you do, if you're able to successfully merge the leisure economy and the purpose economy, this is going beyond the new realities of entertainment. Thank you.